with all of the theories of overcoming gravitation, one might wonder if the Earth's all-encompassing magnetic field could be tapped to generate practical levitation. Intuition and even some empirical evidence as we see here might certainly lead us to believe that it is possible. In this experiment, I am weighing two N48 neodymium rare earth magnets to see if there is a difference in apparent weight on each of their faces. The one inch diameter disc magnet showed an apparent weight increase of 0.58% from side A to side B. And the three inch diameter ring magnet showed a 2% increase from side D to side C. Both small but definite changes. And here I am putting 360 volts across a 4 inch diameter solenoid on one end of a suspended poker and balanced out on the opposite side. The electromagnetic field of the coil is interacting with a 0.5 Gauss geomagnetic field. As with the permanent magnets, the result is very weak, but definitive. Would it be possible with better techniques to greatly increase this effect so that it would be useful and practical? Others have undoubtedly noticed this effect in devices such as the dip needle, which measures magnetic inclination. This is the angle that the geomagnetic field is tilted with respect to the surface of the earth. But could this effect be harnessed for overcoming gravity and generating energy? So there have been some who have theorized an interplay or association between gravity and magnetism, sometimes called magnetogravity or gravitomagnetism. Edward Lee Scownan, builder of modern day megalith coral castle, was one such person who believed in such an association, even going so far to imply that gravity and magnetism were really one and the same. He theorized that Microscopic magnets flowing in streams from the center of the earth and meeting an object would attract the magnets within that object. Magnets which he believed compose all of matter. And when the magnets within these streams and the magnets within the objects interacted, the resulting attraction was akin to gravitation. There are other interesting references to gravitomagnetism in metaphysical literature such as the following passages from a book called The Theubal Prophecy, in which gravity is described as the cold magnetic force of the planet, a magnetic force which could be neutralized by certain vibrations, resulting in anti-gravity and levitation. So as we can see, geomagnetic levitation is certainly alluded to both in alternative science and metaphysical literature. But is it actually possible? A number of th modern theorists certainly think that it is possible and practical, pointing to the similarities between the equations for the magnetic force between two magnets and the gravitational force between two objects. But most mainstream scientists claim that the terrestrial field is far too weak and too uniform to allow for any levitation or even energy generation at all. And still, there are others that say that it is possible, but that it will require impractical amounts of energy. So geomagnetic propulsion has been considered as a potential possibility. But have there been any objective scientific projects, or at least more fleshed out conceptual models, which have attempted to prove these theories? Actually, there are a couple of references to such projects. One is known in UFO lore as Project Magnet. Project Magnet was a program which discreetly studied UFOs, specifically a theory that their propulsion may lie in an interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. It was started by a man named Wilbur Brockhouse Smith, an engineering specialist who went on to become chief engineer for the radio station 
C-J-O-R, in Vancouver, before later working for Canada's Federal Department of Transport in 1939, also serving as senior radio engineer for Transport Canada's Broadcast and Measurement uh, section. The article here lists his professional credentials mainly as designing wartime monitoring systems and making several groundbreaking advances in radio technology, gathering a number of patents in the process thus demonstrating that he was not an amateur by any means and possessed considerable competence in technology and engineering. It was during this time that he would acquire a deep interest in geomagnetic forces, which he believed could be harnessed for energy. And in the late 1940s, he got caught up in the UFO fever that was sweeping the world at the time. It was with these ideas and theories that he would usher in Canada's very weird project to investigate aliens, UFOs, and extraterrestrial technology. He became increasingly convinced that if these craft were indeed on Earth, then they were likely powered by geomagnetic fields, and that his research might result in new propulsion systems that were based on the manipulation of magnetism. A few of his research parameters included investigating the possibility of producing a sink within a magnetic field in order to achieve an energy gradient and thus energy flow. Investigating the possibility of producing single isolated magnetic poles, as well as evaluating the effects of a magnetic field on a rotating curved planar metallic object. With such a proposal in place, Project Magnet was funded in 1952 and operated at Department of Defense facilities. During the course of his research, Smith reported that he had managed to not only extract sufficient energy from the Earth's magnetic field, but implied the design of a small model of a flying saucer, which actually worked according to geomagnetic principles. Another reference to geomagnetic technology is embodied in what is called a magnocraft, a craft which generates powerful pulsating magnetic fields, which interacts with a terrestrial magnetic field for levitation and propulsion. The engine of such a craft is called the oscillatory chamber. This chamber houses several devices called magnetic propulsors, which generates the pulsating magnetic fields. It says here that the magnetic field generated by a one meter long propulsor is about 1000 kilometers in length, one million times longer than the physical propulsor itself. With a ratio of one million to one, the length of such a field will likely overcome the relative uniformity of the geomagnetic field, which is often cited as one of the key limitations in practically harnessing the Earth's magnetic field for lift or for energy. It would also spread the weight of the craft over a much larger magnetic field surface area, hence potentially increasing lift. This is the likely reason why the difference in percentage weight change was different in the weighing magnets experiment shown earlier, in which the magnets both possessed a strength of N48, but the three inch ring magnet exhibit, exhibited a change that was nearly four times greater than the one inch disc magnet. It is also claimed that the magnetcraft's pulsating magnetic field doesn't attract ferromagnetic objects, resulting in fields which behave actually more like hypothetical anti-gravity fields, they are magnetic ones. Now, one of a number of interesting properties of rotational systems, such as those conceptualized by Victor Schauberger and Otis T. Carr, is that magnetic fields are generated as a byproduct of these systems' rotations. In Schauberger's craft, the magnetic fields are generated by ionized molecules of both air and diet magnetic materials, which are spinning at an extremely high speed within the vortex chamber. And in Carr's design, the magnetic fields are generated in at least a couple of ways. One by the movement of the ions within the utron's electrolytic cores, and two by a dozen horseshoe electromagnets which themselves spin, and also through which the utrons spin. Hence in both systems, the fields are rotating magnetic fields. These fields, if strong enough and oriented correctly, 
could function to interact with the geomagnetic field to supplement the levity of the system without the need for a separate magnetic generation system to be added to the payload. Generating magnetic fields in this way might also overcome the limitations of using coils of wire. A related concept within alternative science is the speculation that a rotating vortex of electrified liquid mercury would also result in magnetogravitic levitation. The mercury vortex engine concept is often mentioned in tales of Vimanas. These were anti-gravity crafts said to have existed in ancient India. Interestingly, solid mercury is the world's oldest known superconductor. However, the critical magnetic field for pure mercury seems to be far too low for a practical magnetic levitation system, which likely requires field strengths in the hundreds of Teslas. The critical magnetic field is the field strength at and beyond which a material loses its superconductive state. For mercury, this is about 41 millitesla or 410 gauss, the value of only a medium strength ceramic magnet. But this is for solid inert mercury. It seems uncertain as, as to whether or not this also holds true for a liquid mercury vortex, which is ionized and rotating at extremely high speeds. So the magnetcraft conceptualizes the use of pulsating magnetic fields rather than static fields for the former's possible enhanced ability to induce levitation. This would naturally lead us to speculate as to if a similar property could arise from rotating magnetic fields. And in fact, rotating magnetic fields have often been linked to a number of unusual phenomena, including levitation. Hence, especially in light of Otis T. Carr's rotational system, which was highlighted in the previous video, we might wonder what would happen if we rotated powerful magnetic fields at the car velocity. This was just a brief overview of geomagnetics. We will do an in-depth exploration of some of these interesting concepts in a series of follow-up videos. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And as always, stay tuned.